Well, we have uh, come to the final week in our series, the hashtag, The Struggle is Real. And it's been five weeks focusing on the importance of getting our bodies, our souls, and our minds in shape. But not just to get them in shape, uh, we're talking about this because there's an ultimate purpose in it, and it's getting us ready in all ways to have the greatest of kingdom impacts. Keith talked to us the first week about taking care of our physical bodies. And then Dave explained the importance of eating well. We then had a weekend where uh, we talked about how important it is to have joy in our lives. And, the, and last week, Kareen spoke to why our souls need to be characterized by peace if we want to give our best to Jesus. And this week, we're turning to talking about keeping our minds in shape. In other words, how to continually learn and grow, and how that will make us fit to have the greatest impact for Jesus and His kingdom. But before I go any further, I must digress. We have two cardinal preaching rules here at Grace, two things that we have to live by all the time. The first one is that we are never to say when I was first asked to speak on this subject, we are not allowed to start a sermon by saying, when I was first asked to speak on this subject, we just can't say that. It's a goofy cliche, and we just don't say it here, Grace. And we have a second rule, and we are also never to say, I don't know about you, but I, and then go on to say something. That too is a goofy cliche. I could go into all the reasons why we, are, we have these two rules, but just take my word for it. You'll never hear anyone say either of these two cliched lines here at Grace, except for today, <laughs> because I'm going to break both rules unapologetically. Yes. Well, thank you. <laughs> because when I was first asked to speak on this subject about the importance of learning and growing as an integral part of being fit for the kingdom impact, I was thrilled. It is a subject that I felt I could talk about with some degree of competence, unlike the joy sermon that I gave a couple of weeks ago. And I don't know about you, but I really like it when I'm asked to speak on a subject that I think I know something about, and when a slam dunk passage of Scripture immediately comes to my mind when they say I'm supposed to speak about it. Um, and that's exactly what happened to me when I was first asked to speak on this subject. <laughs> and the Scripture that came to mind immediately was 2 Timothy 2.15. And it's a Scripture that I memorized when I was a child, and it goes like this, study to shew thyself Approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Obviously, I learned it in the King James. Um, and I'm sure you can see why it came to mind when I was first asked to speak on this subject. It clearly says right up front that what we're supposed to be doing, we're supposed to be studying. Studying to show ourselves approved unto God. And by studying, the implication is that we're to be studying the Bible. Um, and I would also bet that over the years I'd heard probably at least a dozen sermons where the preachers emphasized how important it was that I study to show myself approved unto God. But since we don't use the King James here at Grace, uh, we use the New Living Translation. I looked up 2 Timothy 2.15 in the New Living Translation to start preparing for this sermon, and guess what? It doesn't even say anything about studying in the New Living Translation. It says this, work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive His approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. Now, working hard and being a good worker is different in my mind than studying. There's a lot of difference between working hard and studying. In fact, when I looked up this verse in lots of translations, other translations in the King James, not one of them had the word study in it. Not one. So I went to the Greek, and in the original, the Greek is the original language of the New Testament. Uh, 
And the word that's translated study in the King James is the word spudzadzo. Now, spudzadzo, guess what it means in Greek? It doesn't mean to study. It means to be eager to do something or to work hard at something. And my first thought was, hey, wait a minute. All of my life, people have been preaching 2 Timothy 2.15 at me to make me feel guilty that I'm not studying my Bible enough. And study isn't even in the passage. So I dug a little deeper. I looked up the etymology of the word study. Now, I knew that the translators of the King James, when they decided to, king, to translate it in the 17th century, they chose to use 13th century, think about this, 13th century grammar and language as their template for their translation. Well, if you look up study in its etymology, in the 13th century, to study meant to work hard. It didn't mean to study like we... I mean, in other words, study doesn't mean to study in the Bible. It means to work hard at something. Unfortunately, what that did was it shot down my whole sermon. So I had to start over. You know, my slam dunk passage was not going to work anymore because it didn't actually say to use your mind through study like we think. It didn't. I went, so I had to go back and I had to go through the whole Bible to see if it really teaches us that we're supposed to keep our minds in great shape so that we can give our best to serving God's kingdom. I didn't have my, my verse. And what I found out was, yes, it does, yes, it does, but not in the way that I've been taught in the past. I'm pretty sure that every time I'd heard somebody in church talk about the importance of being a lifelong learner or growing in my mind, it had something to do with studying the Bible. And here's what I found. As I recently went through the Bible and looked at lots of people in the Bible who were clearly learning and growing and using the expansion of their mind to do the work of the kingdom, yes, they did know the Word of God. They did. They did. But what really struck me was just how much they were exercising their minds to learn about all sorts of things. Now, I know that you've probably heard what I'm about to say before, but it's something that's really important to what we're trying to say today. It's this, all truth is God's truth. All truth is God's truth. Everything that is true about anything and everything comes from the mind and the heart of God. He is the author of literally what? Everything. And having looked carefully at the whole of the Bible over the last weeks, I realized that God can and he will use any and all of his truth to further his kingdom. This was a revelation to me. Like one huge example is Moses. Uh, Moses uh, was the man who was chosen by God in the Old Testament to lead the Jewish people who'd been in slavery for 400 years in Egypt, and God chose Moses to lead the people out of Egypt and into freedom. Now, that's a huge thing. And he, he even had a hand in writing the first five books of the Bible. He's a pretty important guy. But did you know, did you know that he spent the first 40 years, 40 years of his life as a member of the Egyptian royal family? And what we know from both biblical history and secular history was that a huge part of being in the Egyptian royal family was being trained in what was called all of the wisdom of Egypt. And the wisdom of Egypt was stuff like its literature and its wise sayings and its history and its governmental procedures, even its agricultural systems. Now, you might assume that if a guy's job is going to be that he's going to lead everybody out of Egypt, the last thing he needed to know was stuff about Egypt. And yet, and yet, what we see that when the time came for Moses to lead the Jews out of Egypt, that knowledge about Egypt was exactly what he needed to have credibility to be able to walk right into the Pharaoh's throne room and say, let my people go. And it says elsewhere in the Bible that Moses learned all of the wisdom of Egypt, and boy, did it help him when God said, get going, Moses. His mind was in great shape when it came to all things Egyptian, and he could talk directly to Egyptian rulers and be taken seriously as somebody who'd done the hard work of understanding exactly what their world was about. 
And the other thing is that the record shows us that he also somewhere along the line had grown to know a lot of stuff about the Jewish world as well, the Hebrew world. Um, his record of the beginning of the Hebrew nation that we find in the book of Genesis, it shows incredible knowledge of ancient history. He had to put some kind of time in with somebody from somewhere who taught him about those things. And I can tell you straight up that the Hebrew of Genesis is brilliantly worded. Moses clearly was a man of great learning. It's obvious to me that he used his mind well. He learned and grown in all sorts of ways. His mind was in great shape when it came time to take on the most important task of his life, and that was leading over a million people into freedom. He'd learned about things Egyptian, and he'd learned about things Hebrew, and God, through Moses, changed the world. He changed the world. Now, here's another example from the Bible. About 400 years after Moses, a man named Solomon came along. Now, you can read about Solomon's life in two Old Testament books. One is called 1 Kings, and the other is called 2 Chronicles. Now, Solomon was the son of the man who is universally considered to have been the greatest Jewish king, King David. And can you imagine how difficult it would have been to follow in the greatest king of all time's footsteps to be the next king? Can you imagine how difficult that would have been? And what we see as we read the Old Testament in those two books, we find that God literally came to him and said, I will give you anything. You ask for it and I'll just give it to you. And Solomon, rather than asking for riches or asking for fame or a powerful army or anything like that, what Solomon asked God for was that he would give him the wisdom to rule the nation of Israel with justice and righteousness. And God was really impressed with this request, and well, well, listen to what kind of wisdom God gave to Solomon. God gave Solomon very great wisdom and understanding and knowledge as vast as the sands of the seashore. In fact, his wisdom exceeded that of all the wise men of the east and the wise men of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone else. His fame spread throughout all the surrounding nations. He composed some 3,000 proverbs and wrote 1,005 songs. He could speak with authority on all kinds of plants, from the great cedars of Lebanon to the tiny hyssop that grow from the cracks in the wall. He could speak about animals and birds and small creatures and fish, and kings from every nation sent their ambassadors to listen to the wisdom of Solomon again. Think about this. All truth is God's truth. And the truth that God gave Solomon was, yes, how to rule his people, but he also taught him how to write songs and how to, do, to express great wisdom through Proverbs. And he taught him about trees and plants and fish and animals and all this kind of stuff. And when Solomon was given the kind of knowledge that God felt was important, he was given the learning of what? All sorts of things. And the result was that the world came to him, and they learned not only about plants and birds and fish, but about God, who had made all of these amazing creatures. Listen to this report that's in 2 Chronicles 9. Now, let's all turn to it, okay? I want you to just read along with me. It's on page 369 in the House Bible. It's 2 Chronicles chapter 9, and we're going to read the first eight verses. This is a really amazing little, little bit in the Scripture. It says this, it says, when the queen of Sheba, and she was from Africa, she was a big deal in her day. When the queen of Sheba heard of Solomon's fame, she came to Jerusalem to test him with hard questions. She arrived with a large group of attendants and a great caravan of camels loaded with spices and a large amount of gold and precious jewels. And when she met Solomon, she talked with him about everything she had on her mind. And Solomon had answers for all her questions. Nothing was too hard for him to explain to her. And when the queen of Sheba realized how wise Solomon was and when she saw the palace he had built, and she was overwhelmed. She was also amazed at the food on his tables and the organization of his officials and their splendid clothing and the cupbearers and their robes and the burnt offering Solomon made at the temple of the Lord. And 
She exclaimed to the king, everything I heard in my country about your achievements and wisdom is true. I didn't believe what was said until I arrived here and saw it with my own eyes. In fact, I had not heard the half of your great wisdom. It is far beyond what I was told, how happy your people must be. What a privilege for your officials to stand here day after day listening to your wisdom. Praise the, God, the Lord your God who delights in you and has placed you on the throne as king to rule for him because God loves Israel and desires this kingdom to last forever. And he has made you king over them so you can rule with justice and righteousness. The queen of Sheba listened to Solomon and then who did she praise? God. And you can bet that this is just one example of how amazing the power of the God of Israel is and how it spread everywhere. It, this, this knowledge of the amazing God that we worship spread everywhere. Why? Because Solomon's mind was in great shape. He was ready to speak about anything because everything is God's truth. No question was too hard for him. Now, and I know, I know that this story is about a miraculous thing that happened to Solomon. It's, he had understanding that came straight from the hand of God. But I think it's instructive because when God gave Solomon understanding, he knew that what Solomon needed was something more than just the simple answers that he wanted, the things about leading the government well. What he gave him was something massive. It's proof that the truth that God is interested in us carrying is truth that will be so big that it will change the world. This is what God gave Solomon. Fish, trees, and they're all important to whom? To God, that we know about them. You know, here's another example. Have you heard of Paul the Apostle in the New Testament? He's... Uh, he was one of the most important early Christian, first century Christian leaders. Um, he was a man that started out his life, uh, when he was an adult, he was already a highly educated Jewish radical, is what I would call him. Yet, this guy who was a Jewish radical, one day had a dramatic con conversion to following Jesus. And the conversion was so overwhelming that he gave the rest of his life traveling, he, gave, he just stopped what he was doing and he started traveling all over the Roman world telling everybody he could, whether they were a Jew or a Gentile, about Jesus. And you can read all about Paul in the book of Acts in the New Testament. But in the 17th chapter of the book of Acts, there's a really interesting story. And what we find is that Paul ends up in Athens. Now, Athens is in Greece. And Athens, in the first century, was the center of Greek philosophical learning. It's where all the, the philosophers would go and hang out and debate. Everybody there was, like, really smart, or lots of people that were there. Were, they were drawn to Athens. And uh, Athens and Greek learning was also the center of learning for the whole of the Roman Empire. So we're talking about a really heady place. And Paul is there. And he starts to talk about Jesus, and the whole city gets all stirred up because they like talking about new ideas, and Paul had brought a brand new idea. And while I don't have time to tell you everything about this, just listen to these two verses, this couple of verses that tells us about what happened in Athens with Paul. Paul went to the synagogue to reason with the Jews and, the, and to reason with the God-fearing Gentiles. And he spoke daily in the public square to all hap who happened to be there. He also had a debate with some of the Epicurean and the Stoic philosophers. And when he told them about Jesus and his resurrection, they said, what is this babbler trying to say with these strange ideas he's picked up? Others said, he seems to be preaching some foreign gods. And then they took him to the high council of the city. Come and tell us about this new teaching, they said. You are saying some rather strange things, and we want to know what it's all about. Now, as I said, there's a lot I could say about this chapter and these verses in particular, but what I want to point out is this, that Paul, who starts out as a very learned Jewish man, he had somewhere in, in his life 
learned to speak with convincing knowledge both to Jews and to Gentiles that he would meet in a synagogue. He'd also learned how to talk to people in the city center where people gathered to have general debates. He'd learned enough about Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, and those are the two ends of the Greek philosophy world. They're, they're completely opposite, they're sort of enemies, and yet Paul could talk to both of them. And, then it, and by the way, he's speaking probably in a second language. And then he gets, he, he's overwhelmed them with the way he can speak that he's invited to speak to the members of the Athens City Council. And from what I can tell, this text never says that he got the ability to speak to all of these people well through some miraculous event. No, Paul had clearly somewhere along the line done the hard work of learning about things like rhetoric and philosophy and logic and debate. He'd grown in learning. He was even learning ideas that are antithetical to what he knew to be true. And he did it all, I'm sure, for the purpose of being used by God to further the message of Jesus. In fact, at the end of chapter 17, if you ever go there and read it, you're going to get a list of all the famous Athenian people who became followers of Jesus because of Paul's wise use of the knowledge that he'd learned over the years. Again, all knowledge, even the knowledge of the truths contained in rhetoric or philosophy or logic or debate is God's knowledge. And when our minds are in the equal sort of shape as our bodies and our souls, we shouldn't be surprised when people as important as the Queen of Sheba or the people who are on the city council of Athens, when they say to us, come and tell us about this teaching. And my contention is that when the Bible talks about the importance of learning and growing in our minds, when the subject is getting our minds in shape to have the most impact for the kingdom, it isn't just talking about having a scholar's understanding of all things Christian, not at all. What I believe the entire arc of Scripture is saying is that, yes, we should be able to speak with clarity about our faith, but God's world, His truth, and what is worthy of knowing is far grander and far more amazing than we can ever imagine. And something that's even more important that God seems just fine with using our knowledge of his truth, which again is like all truth. He seems just fine to use that kind of knowledge to have great kingdom impact. God needs all of his people to continually be expanding their minds, learning and growing in all sorts of things. And I'm just going to say, for some of you, it's going to be you're going to expand your mind in history. And others of you, you're drawn to physics. And some of you, chemistry. Some of you are businessmen and, you, and businesswomen. You want to learn about marketing and economics and those kinds of things. Some of you are interested in human psychology. Some of you are interested in animal husbandry. And I'm just going to say, we could go on and on and on. And the truth about the God's world that we find in any of those subjects is what? God's truth, and it's all important. And as followers of Jesus, we've been graced not only with the knowledge of the one who gave us this vast world of information to know, this vast world that is worth looking into and knowing about, we've also been given, and I'll say this very carefully, we've been given the, this muscle in our head by him, the most important muscle that he's given to us, our brains. And he wants us to use it to know about his world. And it's, but you know, just like exercising and eating well and finding joy and allowing peace to control our lives, learning and growing takes discipline. It just does. It takes discipline. I know that our culture is prone to gravitate to entertainment. It's prone to just want to check out and, and be entertained by cat videos and 
things of that sort. You know, it's just way easier. It takes discipline to go, no, no, this is not the way I should use my mind. And the other thing is that we don't tend to want to listen to people that disagree with us. We tend to want to hear people who we agree with. But I'm just going to say, if we want to get the most important muscle that God has given to us in shape, we better start listening to everything so we can use our minds to figure out what is the truth, because the truth belongs to God. Now, I certainly don't want you to think that I'm uh, advocating that we all have to be Renaissance people. We all have to know something about everything. What I am talking about, though, is being disciplined about expanding your mind in the areas that God has uniquely created you to find interesting and important. I am not certain this will happen, but there could be a day. I'm a philosophy guy. I may run into a Stoic. And I might have an, a philosophical discussion about Stoics and the shape of my mind, what kind of shape it's in, will make a difference as to whether I have an impact in that person's life. But for you, it might be something else. Like I said, it could be marketing or African history or Japanese culture. We could go on and on and on. But we learn and grow first because it expands our mind and we learn more about God's world, but also because it makes us possible to speak to other people in ways that they want to listen to us. They will know when we know what we're talking about. They will. And they'll also know if we're not interested in learning anything else. And what I hope they do is after listening to me talking about Stoics, is they want to know about Jesus. Here are four things that I'm committed to when it comes to expanding my mind. First, I want to continually have a curiosity about the world around me. The truth is, I should never run out of things that are surprising, exciting, or will exercise my mind. I'm at the perfect age. I will be 64 this summer. I was clapping. Why? Why? Because I've lasted this long? Uh, what, yeah. What is it? If I knew I was going to last this long, I'd have been a lot care more careful when I was younger. But um, the, the, what was I talking about? Uh, oh, yeah, I'm at the perfect age to think I already know everything. You know, I, it's like I've already lived enough that I already know everything and nobody's going to ever tell me anything new. That's just like, that's crazy talk. I am committed to being continually curious about the world around me. Secondly, I want to have a long view about learning. You've heard that phrase, long, a lifelong learner? I, I'm committed to the fact that learning is never done. I just want to keep learning right up to the end. I always need to be exercising my mind. The third thing that, I need to, that I'm committed to is to staying humble. I don't do this to be... A, know-it-all smarty pants, you know? It's, you don't want to lord it over people. We learn things so that we can do what the next thing is. You exercise your mind because it's a purposed endeavor. We have a bigger purpose behind what we do when we learn about the world, and that is so that we can have great kingdom impact. The more we learn, the more we exercise our mind, the more we'll be able to function in worlds with other people who have been exercising their mind, and we can have great impact in that way. The bottom line for us all as we've talked about over the last five weeks is this, if we take care of our bodies through exercise and eating well, we'll, be, we'll have the strength to, be, to have the greatest kingdom impact. And if we take care of our souls through finding joy and living in, in, with peaceful hearts, we can enter into God's kingdom work with healthy spirits. And, and when we take care of our minds, when we exercise its great capacity to learn and grow and find understanding, we will be able to engage with other people who will want to listen to us. And they'll believe us when we tell them we have found the truth. Now, I know I've been short on specifics, but the specifics come from your own worlds, the world that God has uniquely created you to inhabit. Again, all truth is God's truth. Whether the truth that excites you is seabirds or electronics, or the Bible. It doesn't matter. We simply need to be about discovering his truth, his truth, so that we can bring about his kingdom. You know, I've been thinking a lot about the word study over the last few weeks, 
And I've been thinking that both of its meanings, the ancient one about working hard and the modern one about putting in the effort to learn new things, they both work because we're called to what? To work hard, to work hard to take care of our bodies and our souls and our minds. It just takes hard work. But we're also called to what? Serious study because the struggle is real. But it's also a struggle that is worth the effort because it is a struggle that can be won. And when we win, the world changes. And you know how it changes when we win? The kingdom comes and God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. That is what it's all about. That's what it's all about. Let's pray. Thank you, dear Lord, for what an amazing world you've created. Thank you that you gave us the capacity to learn and grow and use our minds. Thank you that um, you have given us the opportunity not only to know about your world, but to know you, the one who made it. Father, my prayer for us is that you'll keep us curious, that you'll keep us learning, and that you'll keep us humble, and that you'll keep us focusing on the reason that we do all of this, and that is to bring your kingdom into the world. We thank you, dear Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.